the Golden Horde, the state of Jochi. In times gone by, 750 years ago, the state of the Golden Horde arose on the vast expanses of Eurasia. It was called Ulu Ulus, or the state of Jochi, after the name of Jochi Khan, the eldest son of Genghis Khan. Ulus of Jochi was previously assessed by historians as a nomadic state based on animal husbandry. But new archaeological evidence suggests otherwise. During excavations of the cities, numerous architectural monuments, skillful artisan products, and many agricultural crops were found. In this program, we will make an attempt to answer the question of how and in what way over time the nomadic empire turned into a state with a developed urban structure. The life of the people has always very much depended on the weather, the topography, and the availability of water in fertile lands, as well as on the surrounding flora and fauna. Mongolia is located in Central Asia. High ridges encircling the country from almost all sides create a severe continental climate on its territory. Winters are very cold and windy with little snow, while summers are always hot and dry. Mongolia unites vast plains and high mountains, forests, semi-deserts, and deserts on its territory. The peculiarities of the climate and the landscape determined the nature and historical path of the development of the Mongolian civilization. There are peculiar conditions in the steppe, extreme temperature variations, the constantly blowing winds, as well as lack of water. All of this forced the animals to adapt to such difficult conditions. Therefore, the nomads bred special breeds of cattle that were resistant to the harsh climate. The unique natural conditions of this area have influenced and shaped the peculiar way of life and the character of the Mongolian people. After the conquest of the vast Eurasian territory, the Mongols faced a new way of life which had developed under the influence of completely different geographical and climatic conditions. A milder climate prevailed, and the endless steppe was replaced with forests and fields. The Mongols remaining fundamentally nomads continued to live and run their households according to their established traditions for some time. They were engaged in animal husbandry. They raised flocks of sheep, herds of horses, as well as camels. Over time, they were able to successfully raise herds of cows. The peculiar features of the area began to gradually change the usual way of nomadic life of the Mongols. Animal Husbandry in the Golden Horde The Golden Horde exported tens of thousands of horses to India, where they were used for economic purposes. Bulls occupied the second place in terms of exports of the Mongolian state. They were most often sold to European countries. The average height of the Mongols' cattle was almost 10 centimeters higher than that of cattle raised in Eurasia. An important component of the horde's economy was hunting. Trade in valuable furs of sable, yermin, fox, and bear were one of the important items of the state income. Mongols actively mastered fishing on large rivers. They fished not only from the shore, but also from boats.
sun-dried and salted fish, including sturgeon and cured sturgeon fillet, as well as caviar, was exported from the Golden Horde by Italian merchants. The development of fishery required more salt. Salt deposits began to be actively developed. Then salt began to be sold to neighboring countries. What can I say about this great, even countless number of animals in this horde? Will people believe me? There are lots of horses in this land, and they cost a trifle. They feed on them. And in their land, they are as abundant as sheep in our land. Perhaps even more. A Mongol can own several thousand of them. This is how Josephat Barbaro, a diplomat and traveler from Venice, who visited Ulus of Jochi, described the Golden Horde. Another Catholic monk, Plano Carpini, wrote in his manuscripts, They are very rich in cattle, camels, bulls, sheep, goats, and horses. They have such a huge number of package animals, which, in our opinion, cannot be met anywhere else in the world. During the excavation of ancient settlements, scientists discovered fragments of spikelets of grain crops. Thus, they were able to document the fact of cultivation of crop plants. They found samples were dominated by grains of millet, rye, and wheat. Barley, oats, and peas were often found. Traditionally, Ulus of Jochi was assessed by historians as a nomadic state with poorly developed agriculture. But in the light of new archaeological data, this opinion seems to be incorrect. Historians were able to establish the presence of grains of cultivated plants in the preserved ceramic dishes. There is an opinion that the nomads never grew cereals on their territory in the steppes of Mongolia. But actually, this is not the case. They grew millet, which was called black millet. Rice was also well known to them. They chose fertile lands for sowing. The Mongols could roam all summer with their livestock and return to their fields only into the fall, in the time of harvest. When the time for sowing came, it was common practice in the Golden Horde to engage the entire family. The seeds were planted in plowed land, sometimes fertilized with livestock manure. The sowing took several days, and after all the seeds were sown, the families returned to their homes. Having conquered the people of Eurasia, they began to adopt their farming experience. And over a short period of time, the Mongols gradually began to cultivate various types of crops. Not far from Almaty, during excavations of a medieval city dating back to the Golden Horde period, Kazakhstani archaeologists discovered houses of townspeople with many small rooms. Surprisingly, almost every such room had a tandoor, which was an oven for baking bread. Research by historians has shown that originally this oven was intended for cooking meat, as its dimensions were such that it was possible to roast an entire ram carcass. Later, with the development of agriculture, the tandoor began to be used for baking bread. The townspeople of this city used ground tandoors, the sizes of which were very diverse. Their heights could vary from half a meter to over two meters. The shape of the stoves were also different. 
from rounded to oval form. On the one hand, the structure of the tondor is very simple, and on the other, it is extremely efficient. With this form, heat is concentrated in the center and is retained for a long time. Any potter could make it from a mixture of clay, sand, and manure, and sometimes sheep or camel wool was also mixed into the solution. The craftsman formed the desired shape from the prepared manure, after which the oven was dried and fired. Surprisingly, over the hundreds of years of its existence, the tandoor design has not undergone any changes, except that new types of it have emerged. For example, electric or gas tandoors. But until now, we can feast on the tandoor flatbreads and samosas. The surviving sources provide interesting information about what was grown in the Golden Horde. Here is what the passing merchants of that time said. Different trees and different fruits grow in the Horde. Grapes, pomegranates, quince, apples and pears, apricots, peaches and nuts. As for the melon, they consume it in extreme amounts, more than any other, the yellow kind. The melon is preserved, and they have it for the entire year. It has an extraordinary sweetness and pleasant taste. And the melon is transported to the most extreme lands of India and China. There is no better one of all dried fruits. Having conquered crop-producing areas along the Volga River, the nomads of the Golden Horde began to gradually become involved in seasonal farming. This area provided the best agricultural land in terms of warmth, rainfall, and fertility. It is no coincidence that irrigated agriculture and gardening began to develop along the rivers. This allowed the inhabitants of the Golden Horde to grow not only fruit, but a variety of vegetables, such as cucumbers, turnips, cabbage, beets, pumpkins, and much more. The Horde has become famous far beyond its borders, with its watermelons and melons. Merchants and travelers exported dried melons and grapes in large quantities. So, in a matter of decades, the nomadic state turned into a country of big cities. Currently, more than 110 cities and settlements are known dating back to the period of the reign of the Golden Horde. The nomadic economy and nomadic way of life played a huge role in the life of the Golden Horde. In the early days of Batu Khan's empire, the cities looked like a nomadic military camp. Around the Big Khan's yurt were the yurts of the commanders who were loyal to him. The dwellings of the nobility and the Khans were covered with white felt and decorated with ornaments. The ordinary soldiers lived in low and cramped yurts. When there were no active military campaigns, the Mongols had to stay in one place for a long time.
So, at the very beginning, the cities of the Golden Horde resembled large nomad camps. Before the construction of the cities, Batu Khan could move his headquarters easily. The main tent was transported on a huge platform, with dozens of horses carrying it. Over time, the Mongols began to build permanent dwellings. Some part of the nomads became city dwellers, who permanently lived in cities. But most of them only lived in cities in winter, and with the onset of spring, they left to wander the surrounding steppe. In the cold season, the population of the steppe cities increased due to nomadic yurts that formed the quarters of the temporary settlement. The intensive growth of cities began towards the end of the 13th century, when the Golden Horde began to separate from the main headquarters of the Mongol Empire, the city of Karakorum. construction of the site of the city of Sarai, the capital of the Golden Hordes, was not chosen by chance. The Volga River flowed nearby, which was the most important trade route. There were trade routes leading to Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Most of the cities that arose under the Mongols were built on the sites of military camps. For example, the name of the city of Tumen came from the name of the chiefs of the 10,000s garrisons, the Khans Timniks. Other cities of the Golden Horde owed their origin to the caravan trade. These include Solkhat, Azak, Majar, Sarai, Saraychik, Ukyek, and other cities. The city of Ukyek is one of the earliest cities of the Mongolian state. It was founded in the middle of the 13th century. Its remnants are located on the right bank of the Volga, on the outskirts of the modern city of Saratov. The city of Biljamin was located on the right bank of the Volga, its area exceeding 500,000 square meters. From here, the path began to both the Golden Horde's capitals and further to Khorezm, Mongolia, and China. Until now, scientists have not been able to accurately establish the location of the capital of the Golden Horde, the city of Sarai. There are several hypotheses for its possible location in the Astrakhan region. The Volga River was of particular importance for the Mongolian Empire. It was used by merchant ships, carrying out large international transportation of goods. The city of Majar was the largest city in the North Caucasus. Arab traveler Ibn Battuta described it as one of the best Turkic cities, on a large river with gardens and abundant fruit.
most of the information that scientists were able to learn about the Golden Horde was obtained as a result of excavations of ruins of the Golden Horde cities. What influenced the emergence of cities in the steppe? Archaeologists who are excavating medieval settlements in the region of South Kazakhstan will help to answer this question. Previously, many historians believe that as a result of the Mongolian invasions, many cities were plundered and destroyed. Recently, this point of view has been revised by scholars, as new archaeological information is accumulating. It is true that some cities during that period fell into decay, but at the same time, other cities reached incredible heydays. The first Golden Horde cities began to be built in the steppe zone already in the 13th century by the decree of Batu Khan. Archaeologists studying the reasons for this development came to the conclusion that the Han's power needed to create administrative centers to manage the conquered lands. The rulers of the Golden Horde tried to populate the territories with both nomadic and sedentary populations. Initially, such centers were old cities, and later, new ones were built. The cities that were built at the intersection of trade routes became rich and prosperous. They were fundamentally different from the cities of Europe and Asia at that time. First of all, there were no walls. This made it possible to lay wide streets and build neighborhoods. The building material was stone and clay. The very existence of the capital required economic ties with the provinces. Thus, numerous villages began to grow around the cities. Over time, different people and ethnic groups inhabiting the Golden Horde began to merge and unite into a single whole, which contributed to the consolidation of the state. Thus, the Golden Horde became not only the largest in terms of territory and population, but apparently the richest state in Europe and Central Asia. The Golden Horde reached its power thanks to its rulers, who were able to correctly build the government of a state. Having formed his empire, Genghis Khan handed over the western lands to his eldest son, Jochi. Batu Khan, the grandson of Genghis Khan, became famous as the great conqueror of Eurasia. It was under his leadership that the first cities began to be developed. Mengu Khan Timur was the grandson of the famous Batu Khan. He began to mint his own coins. When Tokhta Khan ascended to the throne, he continued the policy of his predecessors. Under his rule, a very important monetary reform was carried out. New coins with a single weight were issued. The period of the greatest political and economic power of the Juchid Empire falls on the reign of Uzbek Khan. Under him, there was a sudden crescent of central power, and a unified system of governance of the empire was formed. The next ruler after Uzbek Khan was Janibek Khan. He intensively developed trade and crafts. Trade and caravan routes became safe and well-developed. They passed through the territory of the Golden Hordes and connected the countries of Europe and Asia. Culture and Crafts in the Golden Horde, in its many cities, various crafts have truly evolved. The production of felt and fabrics were taken to another, more skillful level. Weaving, tanning, pottery, architecture and jewelry made the artisans famous far beyond the Golden Horde. During this period, bazaars were formed which were large centers of international trade. Merchants from all countries came to the Golden Horde to sell their goods and purchase goods from other local craftsmen and artisans. You will learn more about this in our next program.